Well, thank you so much for coming to our talk this evening as part of our Curious Art series at the Rufus Porter Museum. And we are thrilled to have our friend Carolyn Grimm here tonight to talk to us about Nathan Church, the gentleman who lived in this house. Um, I have my little cheat sheet here so I can tell you a little bit about Carolyn. She um, moved to Bridgeton with her family when she was seven years old, and she grew up surrounded by historic houses. Steeped in stories of the past, and her curiosity got the better of her. She immersed herself in local history for the sheer joy of uncovering the past lives of neighbors long gone, and she wrote her first paper on the topic in high school. Now, since that time, she's often found haunting cemeteries, poring <laughs> over fragile letters, reading crumbling newspapers, tramping across far-flung battlefields, and traveling down forgotten roads. And you can sometimes see her traveling down Main Street with her partner in crime, Margaret Reimer, in their History Honeys tour, which is fabulous, and I highly recommend. That's through Bridgeton Historical Society. She is the author of the Voices of Pondicherry series, which begins with the novel Wild Sweeps the Wind, and you can learn even more about Carolyn on Amazon. Do you have your own website, too, oh, Carolyn? Yeah. Oh, she has a few websites, too, so just look her up. <laughs> Carolyn D. Grimm, online. Um, you know, in, in introducing you, Carolyn, I forgot to introduce myself. I am Martha Cummings, the director of Rufus Porter Museum, so please forgive me. My head is kind of swirling tonight. Um, again, we're so glad to have you here for our true 19th century experience as we're sitting here kind of dripping. You have your fans. We appreciate your patience with us, and we're so excited to have you here in the Nathan Church House, which we just moved last fall, so hopefully some of you got to see it come down Main Street, and if you didn't, if you take a few minutes after the talk tonight, you can follow our photography exhibit that we have here highlighting that move. Just a couple of other things, and I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn. We have an ice cream social on Saturday here outside. We're going to have some wonderful kids activities ice cream. It's going to be from 12 to 2. In the newspaper it says 12 to 4, but we've amended that to 12 to 2. Um, and then we have our mystery history tour coming up on August 17th. The tickets are on sale. We have seven fabulous sites in Bridgeton, um, most of which are not open to the public. Um, some wonderful wallpaper and other details in some of these grand places, so we invite you to join us that day. That's Thursday, August 17th from 2 to 6. But now we will <laughs> go back in time with Carolyn and learning more about Nathan Church. So, thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to begin tonight talking about not Nathan Church, because I happened to come across something just today that I thought you might be interested in. So this is a book called Short as Any Dream, and it was written by Elizabeth Shepley Sargent. She is the, a, one of the descendants of the Pearly family, who, of course, was one of the early families here. And last year on the Mystery History Tour, we had Enoch Pearly's cabin as one of the stops. Mm -hmm. And I got to be there and hang out on the lake with that. <laughs> but she was uh, the holder of some of the Pearly family memorabilia. And I'm getting a I'm getting a note a note from the back saying louder. We got no, the fans. Yeah, we got the fans to deal with. So I will try to do my best teacher voice. Thank okay. <laughs> So anyway, she was the owner of some of the Pearly family memorabilia, and she kind of felt it as a burden more, I think, than a privilege. So it's sort of like laid heavy on her shoulders. But she wrote a memoir, and it was the only novel that she wrote. She took the story of the family that she had been told over and over again, year after year after year, and she fictionalized it. And in the front of this particular copy of the book, it shows um, the key so that you can figure out who she's really talking about. So she changed the Pearly family to the Penton family, and the Feathertons were the Fessendens. 
So she's changed up a lot of things, but you can still figure out who the people are. So I'm going to give you a little excerpt from it that I just came across today. And it's Enoch Curley and two of his daughters, and they're talking about something that the daughters want. And Enoch Curley was very tight with a, with a buck, but he could not say no to his children, particularly his daughters. He wanted them to have all of the fine things. So the two sisters are talking, and it's Hulda and Rebecca, his daughters. And, and uh, Hulda says, Sister and I were talking of an oil cloth, sir. And then Nancy says, yes, Rufus Jones hmm, has consented to paint us an oil cloth, which will be very handsome, a dark green with a border of another color. Rufus is anxious at his occupation. He will do it well. I said, well, I think I know who that is. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a really interesting book if you're into the whole Bridgeton history thing. If you can get your hands on one of these, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to go through and try to sort out who's who. But uh, one of the reasons that I know as much as I do about the Pearly family is because of this book. Because it really gives you insight into their family life. So the Pearly family, I'm going to go back in time quite a bit here. Uh, back in, oh gosh, back in 1630, before I was even born. Uh, a group of folks came over from England and they founded what was known as the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Now what does that have to do with Nathan Church? It has everything to do with Nathan Church. It has everything to do with the history of Bridgeton. So the people that came over on those ships had names like Pearlie, Putnam, Porter, Church. They all came over as part of that group. And then what happened is when they came into the Salem area, and then they kind of started to spread out. And they spread out because they needed land. And they just kept spreading and spreading. And uh, so in West Boxford, that's where the Pearlie family ended up. It's also where the Porter family ended up. So um, his, uh, Rufus Porter's great-grandfather was the wealthiest uh, landowner in West Boxford, which was also where the Pearlies lived. So the families knew each other, clearly. And we're still trying to see what the connection is between the families, whether there is a, um, a relationship stronger than just neighbors. And I think we'll probably find out that they're cousins of some sort. But anyway, so as things started to expand, they were looking for more land. And their eyes turned to the other part of Massachusetts, which we now know as Maine. So they were looking for land. And they came up with this great idea. There was a, uh, a promise that had been made by the king to a bunch of soldiers uh, that if they fought for the king, they would be given land. Well, when it came time for them to get their land, they didn't. So they got paid in some worthless money. And then they got given this land grant in New Hampshire and then uh, the folks in New Hampshire said, why is Massachusetts giving away our land? So it became a whole big thing. So they still didn't get their land. And then finally they did get their land, the descendants, like a couple generations later. And that land ended up being, guess where? The lovely town of Bridgeton, Maine. It wasn't called Bridgeton quite yet. So that's how all the folks ended up here. The Ingalls and the Pearlies and the Putnams and the Porters, they all ended up here because of that. So the Massachusetts Bay Colony to Bridgeton, Maine wasn't that big of a leap. So the church family was in Massachusetts. They were in Hadley, or South Hadley, to be more, more direct. Um, have you been to South Hadley? We went to several times. Oh, wow. We have some possible, you know. We know nothing. <laughs> you may find out that you're cousins. I was going to say we're not family. <laughs> so, um, the proprietors of Bridgeton had to do certain things. They had to get 30 families settled. They had to um, build a meeting house. They had to find a settled minister for the area. He had to be a learned Protestant minister. None of that other kind. Learned Protestant minister. So what they did, it took them a while to, to get those 30 families because there was all kinds of stuff. There was a revolutionary war. There was stuff. It was a, uh, it was a whole thing. <laughs> so um, we know that Enoch Purley was up here in 1773, 
because he wrote he wrote a letter back to his family in, in Massachusetts. So he was up here building houses and he was hunting for the people. He was hoping to get a moose to see the people through the winter. So he has a lot of letters that he wrote to his brother Thomas. So we have a lot of information about his family and what was going on in the, in the area. So. Once they got things a little bit under control, because I mean it was wilderness, it was just wall-to-wall -wall trees. It was, um, it, you know, you just imagine like looking out every day at like wall-to-wall -wall trees and how oppressive that might be. But once they finally got some settlement going, they decided that they had to have a place to hold their meetings, their Sunday meetings. So when Lieutenant John Peabody came to town, he was Enoch Curley's brother-in-law, married to Enoch Curley's sister Mary. They built his house in South Bridgeton so that it had a room large enough to hold a church service. And that's where the church services were held for a number of years. So as time moved on, they started saying, well, we really need to get a settled minister now. So they went, they went looking, but they didn't look very far. Because Enoch Curley and Mrs. Peabody had this nephew. Well, was his, they had a niece who was married to a minister. He had just graduated from Dartmouth College. So he said, hey, how about you come up here? So he came up here for a little while and seems to have been here before he was officially the pastor. But once they got him up here, uh, 1788, yeah, 1788 he came up here. It was a big year for Nathan Church because he got a job which allowed him to get married. Uh, and then he came up here and uh, within a year, had his first daughter, Harriet. So it was a very busy year. Um, they came up here to this house. So this house was built for them so that they would have a place to live. Now I'm not sure whether Mrs. Church came up that first year or not because he got the job in November and they got married in December. I saw one note that said, one record that said their oldest daughter who was born um, nine months and a day later um, she, it said that she was born in South Hadley, so it's possible that Mrs. Church stayed down there for a little while until maybe they got the house finished or something along those lines. Um,